namaskaram to everybody so uh, as we are having this introduction to temple architecture in four sessions today i will introduce the concept of temple as, uh, as such in the indian perspective and i'll also talk about which are the texts which support the knowledge of temple architecture temple building and other things an introduction into those two subjects and from tomorrow onwards we will discuss about the shadvargas and the other architectural members of the temple proper so first we will have to understand what is the concept of temple as such see in the contemporary days the concept of temple has been diluted a lot uh, it is just considered a place of it's a religious center where only prayers are done or it is something related only with uh, you know uh, religiosity or spirituality like that we have many uh, notions about the temple in the modern days especially we do not uh, relate or accommodate temple into our other social uh, our other social activities but in the indian concept temple of course was a center where people could uh, achieve some spiritual uh, knowledge they were also trained in a lot of religious activities but it was not restricted only to something which is very uh, you know uh, ritual oriented uh, structure or something so temple it served as a basically as a school apart from uh, being a religious center then it, uh, it was it served as a place where uh, various kind of cultural activities Uh, were conducted then it was further it is a place where legal activities happened and lot of commerce you know activities like banking and other such uh, commercial activities took place in in the temple so therefore temple was the nucleus center of any uh, village or township in which it was built so it was not that uh, temple meant only for prayers and no other activity would happen there but uh, in the very recent past that is say about uh, 150 200 years back gradually during the british period each and every aspect that was associated with the temple was removed from the temple premises or the complex and they were given some uh, separate status in the society this has actually harmed the social structure of the modern society also because until it was associated with temple there was a very strict discipline and you know a, a truthful and a dharmic approach towards all the activities because in india when compared to the western world for us indians we have never uh, had this concept of uh, a social life and religious life to be very parallel or separate entities for us every action which we Uh, which we participate may it be worldly may it be materialistic may it be social we do attach a, a kind of divinity to it and through that we you know we take the activities to a ritualistic level and we bring down the divine power to get uh, you know a, a kind of uh, culmination with us so with this concept that uh, the temple was bridging between the common person and the supreme divine be today it is lost its uh, you know the original glory of course we shall hope for the best in the near future if it can regain that its original purpose or original uh, status it will be very helpful for the indian society now talking about the perceptions of uh, the temple structure as i was mentioning the entire structure of the temple it itself is considered as the embodiment of the uh, the divine uh, form which we usually install in the garbhagriha so before the installation process the to the temple structure which will be erected the land selection itself is been described in the uh, texts in a very detailed manner so i will explain about that part when i am talking about the construction methodology but here we will understand that the structure of the temple on the ground plan it is considered as the 
vastu purusha and the prasada purusha forms of vastu purusha and prasada purusha now the temple plan is usually uh, identified with the vastu purusha while the elevation of the temple from the lower lowest molding till the pinnacle or the kalasha of the temple it is considered as the prasada purusha now there are some points which i will try to explain while i am uh, talking about the vastu granthas also because they you you may this it may get overlapped now so here on the on the picture you can see the face of the vastu purusha purusha is considered to be the garbhagraha portion the neck is the antarala portion then from the chest up to the waist almost it is considered as the guda mantapa the vakshasthala or the chest is considered the guda mantapa we have the balipeta which is the nabhi portion then we have the dvatastamba which is the shishna of the vastu purusha or the phallic phallus of the vastu purusha then we have the uh, mahadwara which is uh, the feet of the uh, vastu purusha likewise in the elevation the, the temple structure is com compared with the prasada purusha now the the lowest portion till the, the top of the adhisthana it is considered as up to the from the feet till the knee of the uh, vastu prasada purusha then uh, the upper part is considered from the knee till the waist that is the bitti part then the prastara is considered as the waist the torso above is the griva and shikara then we have the uh, kalasha which is the shira or shikha of the vastu purusha the concept is that see usually the parts below the prastara is called as the bhumi varga while the parts above the prastara are considered as the akasha varga this is to denote that the bhumi varga will have you know the more of a, a materialistic approach worldly requirements and it is for the human beings while you cross that level and we we reach a point above the human level we will reach that uh, the realization level where we start uh, concentrating on the metaphysical part the supreme power so that will be in the akasha varga that is why usually what happens the walls of the temple are invariably decorated with more of life and luxury and pompous decorations while the prasada will have more of uh, divine murtis samhara murtis and such uh, forms in the prasada part and in the prastara very surprisingly in many instances we also find the form of vastu purusha or various forms of the demigods who are in between the human level and the celestial level so see this plan what you are seeing is of a dravida temple but the same concept is applicable even in the nagara style you can see that even in the nagara temple the plan of the temple is considered as the uh, vastu purusha who is lying down and they also further try to identify the uh, major shat chakras and the sahasrara chakra in the form uh, in the form of the ground plan whilst this elevation we can see that the prasad purusha the same concept what we see in the dravida uh, vimana that is the same concept we are seeing in the nagara vimana also that is and many a times the nagara adjuncts are also called with the uh, bodily names for example the adhisthana is usually referred to as pada or janga in the nagara uh, in the nagara glossary of terms so uh, here we can see that the again the, the feet of the uh, vastu purusha is the mahadwara from there we have other uh, adjuncts and all the shat chakras are identified in the ground plan of the temple so these uh, so what happens for devotees for commoners for the laity the temple is more you know it's a place where they uh, offer their prayers and uh, place their requirements and requests before the deity so for them the lower uh, chakras will be working and uh, they will you know have the activation while people who come there with a spiritual pursuit 
they can experience that the upper chakras gets uh, energized when they are in the temple premises so this is the uh, divine perception of how a temple is considered it is not just a structure built of stones wood brick or mortar but before uh, uh, while i mean in the course of the erection of a temple and the installation of the god we have to say that all these energy points are energized and it the, the entire complex of the temple is sanctified to a very great extent now i will talk a little bit about the literature available for understanding these temple uh, the temple culture and temple rituals i on the temple structure see there are two major branches of texts literature which are called as the agamas and the uh, vastu granthas now vastu granthas are those granthas which deal purely with the construction part of the temple now there are vastu granthas which talk about the selection of the land how the land has to be selected so what are the parameters in which you have to uh, find the direction of the uh, the land from where you have to uh, erect the entrance of the temple all these things are described in the initial part then the vastu granthas they concentrate as i said more on the uh, structural part than the uh, spiritual aspects it does not mean it is void of spiritual uh, elements there are spiritual elements and it also says what are the methods where you have to energize the structure but the concentration is more the emphasis is laid more upon the structural part of the temple so therefore uh, it in, in uh, it begins with the selection of the site uh, after that the vastu granthas also talk about how the directions in the site has to be marked okay okay so uh, how the eight cardinal directions are marked how they have to be marked how the east has to be decided north has to be decided and all these markings are dealt with in the vastu granthas then after the selection of land and marking of the uh, you know the directions and the things a lot of rituals are performed to uh, you know uh, invoke various uh, divine semi divine demi divine beings in in that particular site for the uh, welfare just not of the uh, builder but even of the common lady who visit the temple after this the vastu granthas they can they start concentrating on the construction methodology how uh, a foundation pit is done dug how there are how, what are the architectural members what are the shadvargas of the temple how they are built what are their varieties what is their purpose what is their utility and what happens in the description as we all know there are many factors which are more utilitarian and there are some factors which are just decorative and sometimes the utilitarian uh, adjuncts also need to be decorated for the elegance you know or, or the enhancements of the beauty of the structure while there are some decorative elements which though they are they seem to be decorative they carry a lot of uh, uh, you know uh, metaphysical uh, symbolism in them so therefore uh, each of these uh, adjuncts and members have been separately dealt with in various chapters and then after the the main structure of the temple the vastu granthas also talk about other like, uh, subordinate shrines which have to be built around the uh, main shrine as the parivara aliyas and other things about which we will know in the future lecture this is just the introduction for the vastu shastra granthas i am talking now and it also talks about the iconography of the various deities suppose you are building a temple dedicated to vishnu so what is the vaikana vaishnava iconography what are the things you have to follow now if you have uh, parivara aliyas they are classified into various categories what are their ca those categories what are they and what are the deities who fall under that particular categories for a vishnu temple all these things will be explained if it's a shiva temple likewise all these uh, you know the shiva uh, temples 
So the Shaiva deities and they, that Parivara will be described. And if it's a Shakta temple, it's a Devi temple, the same thing will be repeated from the Devi. Now, after this repetition, in between, while it is talking about the construction, structure, iconography and all those things, in between the Vastu Shastra Granthas also, they lay emphasize on the, you know, the ritualistic parts like how some mantras have to be used, the prayoga of the mantras for the instigation of some uh, spiritual power at particular points in the temple complex. This will be intermediate discussions. After that, it also talks about the, uh, the doorways, gateways and everything, which you can see in the in our future discussion, we will come across all those things. So, Vastu Grantha are that set of Granthas which concentrate mostly on the structural part. And there are more than 500 Vastu Granthas which are available today. Some of them are in the manuscript forum. There are few Vastu Granthas uh, which are published, which are available in the published works also. And of them, some of the authentic uh, works which we uh, consider are the works like Mayamata, Kashyaprashilpa and uh, various such texts are available. Now there are some texts like Manasara, Ishana Shiva Gurudeva Paddhati and the Shilpa Ratna. These are all the texts of a later date. There is another uh, point which you have to note while discussing the texts of uh, our uh, Vastu Granthas or whatever in the Indian context generally. Our scholars, our rishis, they never bothered about the uh, credit of the authorship, copyright or the dating of the text. They were only interested in conveying the proper message to the proper people at the proper time. So it was more of imparting knowledge and using that knowledge for our spiritual betterment. So they did not bother. And another uh, point we have to remember is Indians have always be believed in a cyclic time. It has been never a linear time. So it, as it's a cyclic time, they felt everything has to repeat again. So what we are doing is just, it's a, it's a part of the flow. What I'm contributing is a part of the flow. And they also had to give accommodation for the later people to include something into the text according to the contemporary necessities as the technology develops. So therefore what happens, we may find many interesting uh, features which we find in the structure post say about uh, 13th century or 14th century and it will be mentioned in a, a text which may also have started from the 10th century itself. So this shows that there was a provision for the inclusion of the various styles and uh, various other, uh, uh, you know, medium, which which uh, found in a later date than the text. It was not considered as uh, plagiarism or something because they did not do it with a selfish motive. And that is why the taking the credit for the authorship was also not very, very, uh, you know, they, they were not very, uh, attached to it, we are not very fanatic about it. So the Vastu Granthas have all these uh, ideologies behind and uh, there are some important, uh, as I was mentioning about Manasara, Ishana Guru, they, they, they mentioned Manasara which is a 16th century text. It mentions that the author says that he has referred more than 300 Vastu texts of the earlier people. Likewise, Mayamata which is uh, 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 till date, it is the oldest available text on the Dravidian architecture. That also talks about the earlier uh, scholars who have uh, written on the Vastu Shastra. So therefore, we can see that we have had a voluminous uh, uh, proportion of these Vastu Granthas. Unfortunately, many of them have been lost. Some of them are still in the manuscript forum and many of them have been published also. So it is our duty to uh, dig it out, read the original, try to understand it and then apply it on the existing structures. So to quote some important texts as I was mentioning, uh, Kashyap Shilpa Shastra is one such text. We have Nibandha, Kataka Bhushana, Nagnaj Chitra Lakshana, Tantra Samuchaya. These are all some of the Vastu Shastra Granthas. There are some uh, the Vastu Shastra Granthas they also mention about 
the town planning and the village planning uh, as grama lakshana and nagara lakshana in their chapters and there are some sha vastu granthas like uh, nara samhita and manushyalaya chandrika which are dedicated only for the civil architecture it, it deals only with the civil architecture and it does not uh, uh, you know uh, ponder too much into the temple architecture part but there are texts uh, like uh, mayamata which deal only with the temple architecture though there is a mention of nagara and grama lakshana then texts like manasara and ishan shukar dev dev paddhati they also mention the earlier texts which we have they have referred to and how it has to be applied in that particular context so in uh, for example in ishana shivagurudev paddhati there we find the frequent reference like iti mayaha iti kashyapaha like that it keeps on telling so it in ibandaha this shows that he is telling that this argument or this description is what is done in the uh, text of maya or the text of kashyapa like this now after this vastu granthas the next corpus of literature which talks about temple architecture are the agamas agamas are are a very important and a very uh, sanctified group of texts okay so now agamas are actually a part of the vedic literature itself the vedic literature is broadly classified into nigamas and agamas nigamas are the samhita bhaga or the mantra bhaga whilst agamas are the those are agamas are those texts which apply the vedic uh, uh, incantations into the ritualistic part of the temple or for the daily use of the common human people common people so therefore uh, agamas are the text which guide not only the structural part of the temple but also the ritualistic part of the temple and it also talks about the spiritual well being of the uh, human being now these agamas usually are divided into four parts the four parts are called either called as kandas or padas so the four parts are usually the charya pada kriya pada yoga pada and gnana pada the, the, the pada may be replaced by kanda also these are the major uh, divisions of an agama again agamas are broadly classified into three major uh, branches as shaiva vaishnava and shakta shaiva agamas are there are 28 major shaiva agamas beginning from uh, the kamika up to the vatula so it is overall called as kamika adi vatula vatula antaha there is the 28 agamas which come under the shaiva pantheon these shaiva agamas which are 28 in number are further divided into two parts the first 10 agamas they fall under shaiva agamas and the, the from the 11th agama till the 28th agama they are the 8, 18 rudra agamas or raudra agamas these two are the bifurcations we find in the shaiva agamas but the concept is almost similar same talking about the upasana of shiva as the supreme being then comes Vai- vaishnava agamas the vaishnava agamas are broadly classified into two they are vaikhanasa and pancharatra and uh, i'll just uh, mention one one thing here usually this information i will not put on this slide because i want the students to take them down and have complete concentration listening to the terminology if we put on this slide their their view will be only on seeing this slide and they will not uh, note down the names or the divisions so that's why i don't uh, put lot of text in my slides <clears throat> so coming back to the vaishnava agamas so vaishnava agamas are broadly two it is the vaikhanasa and the pancharatra agama vaikhanasa agama and pancharatra agama they are divided into a lot of uh, as i said kandas and samhitas the pancharatra agamas have a lot of samhitas like ishvara samhita uh, padma samhita narayana samhita these are all the pancharatra agamas and uh, kashyapa gnana kanda and all these things uh, like uh, khiladikara 
all these things are the uh, text of the vaikhana saga here what happens not much difference it talks about vishnu as the uh, major uh, uh, you know the major the supreme being upon which the sadaka has to concentrate now these sagamas they support or uh, the support the vastu granthas by guiding the vastu granthas into the parivar aliyas and parivar devatas and their duties that is one thing we have to understand for example mayamata if you are reading studying matam mayamata we can know that mayamata is greatly influenced by the purva kamika because whatever the explanation of the forms of various uh, such things we get in purva kamika we see that it is it is been supported by the text mayamata so therefore this agamas and vastu granthas also have this uh, uh, you know this uh, uh, inter giving and taking principle among themselves then agamas uh, the four parts are very broadly explained them charya pada deals with the rituals which have to be conducted in a temple uh, about other you know uh, a lot of rituals are there there are some rituals which are to be uh, conducted only in the garbhagriha so what those uh, the rituals they involve only one set of people they who are initiated into that school of uh, you know knowledge and they will be initiated into that particular form of the deity upon which they have to meditate upon before the installation all these details we get about prana pratishtapana and other things we can we get in the uh, charya pada part of it if uh, somebody is interested in, in some of the future lectures we can also discuss what happens during the prana pratishtapana for the better understanding but as of now i feel just this broad uh, introduction would be sufficient then uh, so the charya pada discusses about the the installation of various divine energies throughout the temple complex then comes the kriya pada kriya pada will deal and discuss more about the structure of the temple whatever vastu grantha elaborate where vastu granthas they do elaborate a lot for example in the kriya pada of an agama it broadly talks about the shadvargas but a vastu shastra grantha explains each and every shadvarga in great detail and it shares says what has to be applied to what which adhishthana is suitable for which temple all those things are discussed in the vastu shastra grantha but the broad introduction to temple architecture is given in the agamas in the kriya pada so no knowing kriya pada of an agama also becomes very essential to understand the temple architecture the third part is yoga pada and gnana pada gnana pada the terms itself shows that the first two they take the common people to the religious level to the ritualistic level and they involve the people in various rituals the next two parts they will try to elevate the people who are spiritual seekers who are the sadhakas or the upasakas to move a higher level above these two uh, earlier stages so yoga pada is that pada where it talks about the self restrainment and the sadhaka how he has to do sadhana through hatha yoga and also try to realize the the supreme being through yoga so that is yoga pada and gnana pada yoga is something which uh, as i said they are again again interdependent both yoga and gnana to achieve gnana we have to have some restrainment and constrainment of our physical and mental uh, entities for which the yoga supports and the output of it is understood by the gnana we get achieve and both these padas though there are a lot of uh, methods of adaptation which are mentioned they are more experiential these things we have to experience after the thorough study of those padas in the texts now apart from these two major branches of uh, literature the vastu shastra granthas and agamas we have a lot of other literature which helps us to understand the completeness of a temple for example puranas like matsya purana garuda purana agni purana vishnu dharmotra purana all these texts there is there are many more other puranas as well as mahapuranas as well as upapuranas which furnish a great detail about 
the temple architecture. And Agni Purana, especially Vishnu Dharmottar Purana and Agni Purana are the Puranas which have a great number of chapters like 200 and odd chapters dedicated solely for temple architecture and iconography. So these are the next corpus of literature we have to understand for the knowing of temple architecture. Finally, the if we are well acquainted with, it is not a hard and fast proof that we have to know, but it is always better to have an introduction into various inscriptions which talk about the, the temple building. And there are also some literary works which have a lot of description of you know, a city, a township or a temple for, through which we can know how these, uh, see what happens in a Vastu Grantha, we get the definitions. But how do we understand the application of it? And how we understand that it was a common, uh, you know, common dialect, use of common terms amongst the common people. Such things we can know through the literature part of it. So with that, we can have, we can enhance our uh, uh, knowledge of temple architecture to a very great extent by all these uh, sources and understand uh, the, uh, the temple architecture. Now, I will come to the construction methodology of the temple. We have to know about the construction methodology before understanding the structural adjuncts of uh, the main temple structure. Now, usually in uh, the Indian context, when a temple was being built, just not the temple, even various other uh, structures, when they were built, the land which, which was dug for the uh, you know, the stability of the structure was not very deep. So even the, the Bhradeshwara temple of Tanjavur is supposed to have only about 5-6 feet deep foundation while the entire structure stands above the ground level. So they did not dig very deep into the ground. That is why in the selection of the ground itself, the text advise that you have to select a land which is by nature very strong and various tests are done by, uh, you know, uh, uh, soaking it in water or allowing water to flow over it to see the, the damp of the land, if it uh, absorbs more uh, water or if it leaves more water. All these tests are given in the text. But it says that you have to dig a pit and that pit, it is better you get some hard, uh, you know, uh, hard floor level. Once you get the text star that the lowest uh, portion of the pit has to be filled with rocks or small boulders which are in to the size of an elephant skull. So the elephant head, elephant head skull will naturally be of a, a huger uh, size compared to the other creatures. So the first layer of stones which have to be uh, filled, which have to, the pit has to be filled. The first layer should be here. You can see that there are three rows of huge stones or boulders which are placed, which are huge in size. So it says that that should be to the size of an elephant head. After that, it says that then you will have two, three rows of say, the same stones, which are to the size of a horse head. And while arranging these uh, stones, we have to see to it that it is done in a very, uh, very strengthening way. There is no much gap given in between and the gap has to be filled with sand. You can observe here one more thing is the, the, the contour line is somewhat tapering. It is not very straight line, it is tapering. So once you have dug with the tapering, it will give more strength and the sand will help to hold all these, uh, these things together. And then on the topmost layer, we have to fill it with pebbles and debris and you have to, uh, you know, uh, uh, beat it properly. You know, uh, I think, uh, what is the term we use? It has to be completely leveled equally. And above that, it has to be paved with stone slabs like this. Now, these stone slabs, which are, which are paved above the pit, foundation pit, is 
will act as the lowest molding of the adhisthana that is upana so what is upana what is adhisthana we will see in our tomorrow's lecture where we will discuss in the shadvargas now the texts also say that after the pit is dug the garbhanyasa is done and before laying the strong stones and other things there must be the center point which has to be identified which is considered as the brahma bindu and this brahma bindu is also considered as the brumadhya of the vastu purusha to denote the agna chakra so that is where the supreme most energy will lie so we have to energize it by some of the rituals by some of the chantings and some of the invocations we have to do there and that brahma bindu has to be uh, laid or paved with what is called as prathameshtika this prathameshti prathama means first ishtika means bricks so first pratha the first layer of uh, ishtika they may be arranged in a swastika pattern or in a circular pattern so it is called as prathameshtika or vastu chakra according to the shape of it and after that vastu chakra is invoked and you know prayed and energized then the pit filling starts now what happens many a times when you are studying the structure uh, structural temples we really do not know what is beneath the ground so at such points archaeologists have always have the help of dilapidated structures or the ruins ruins are attract the archaeologists more or the researchers more because the the ruined form or the ruined building exposes to us what the construction methodology usually was because if the structure is completely intact we cannot know how the uh, the form inner strengthening was given to it we know that it is strong and it has been strengthened but what are the nuances of the construction methodology we can know only through the dilapidated structures and the ruins likewise <clears throat> now uh, this is from talka while my guide my guru dr ms krishnamurthy prof ms krishnamurthy was conducting an excavation in talka he found a temple site and he also found the lowest moldings of the adhisthana in that particular temple site now after noting that he saw that below the level see here we can see the stones paved for the upana of the structure and into that we have we can see that it is being filled with various debris and below the debris below the this thing a vastu chakra has been formed a circular form of bricks have been laid so this this we can know see there are some scholars who have an argument that the shastra granthas start dating only after 10th century or gupta age like this there are various uh, arguments especially by the western scholars when it comes to dating the texts but we have to also have other evidence now this particular pit can be dated between 1st century bc and 2nd century ad that is 1st century before the common era and 2nd century of the common era how we have they come to that conclusion is while before excavating this particular chakra even in the before season itself they found what is called what this jar there were four such jars with various things like uh, you know they had some paddy grain and there were some other uh, things which had perished also some of them had lost their original form so this shows that the agamas which mentioned that there should be some precious stone some uh, metal metal and some uh, you know kind of uh, dhanya or paddy and such other uh, uh, you know cereals which are to be preserved under the garbhagriha they have to be kept in a kumbha and it has to be put into the ground so now this is these parts have served that purpose because we have also seen that we have got the remnants of some uh, paddy <coughs> buff uh, in the parts now these four parts were placed above this uh, vastu chakra so this shows and this parts they are the uh, uh, Reset quartet wave or RC RCW as they are called, which was used between widely widely used between first century before the common era 
up to the second century common era. After that, we do not come across this Asset Quartet Way or the RCW as it is called in the archaeological term. So, this shows the antiquity of temple building according to a Vastu Shastra Grantha can be dated back even to, to a lot of centuries. Now, these are the two temple plans where we can see this is this one is a common humble temple plan where the main adjuncts of the temple can be seen. So, no temple is a temple without this part, that is the Garbhagriha. Without Garbhagriha, there is no temple at all. So, uh, Garbhagriha is the essential adjunct of a temple, while all the other adjuncts of a temple, they become optional. They can be there or a temple can even survive without the other parts. There may be a temple just with the Garbhagriha, and a Mukhachatushki, or what is called as a porch. And there may be elaborate temples with a lot of mantapas, halls, adjuncts, you know, the, <clears throat> the porches and various other things surrounding the main shrine. So, on plan, this is the Garbhagriha, this is the Antarada. Here we can, uh, this is the Antarada. Is it clear? Then we have the Guda Mantapa. This Guda Mantapa has three Mukha Mantapas. Now, in our plan, the temple plan is divided into two broad categories as Sandhara and Nirandhara. Sandhara means those temples where you will have a Pradakshina Patha or circumambulatory path inside the temple building structure itself surrounding the Garbhagraha. Now, this is both uh, utilitarian as well as a method to strengthen the structure. Now, Pradakshina becomes secondary. The primary reason for this Sandhara construction is that when the temples were being built with complete stone medium, the stone prasada needed to have a strong basement below it. So, prasada is the superstructure part above the temple building, above the Garbhagriha. Now, if you are building a very tall or a very bulky kind of a prasada, naturally the lower uh, building had to be, had to have a lot of strength. Another thing we have to understand is in the Indian temple building technology, no form of adhesive was used to stick two stones or to hold two uh, uh, stone slabs together either metal or any other adhesive life model was used. So, all these stones, uh, boulders which were dressed and decorated, they were placed one above the other, one above the other, uh, purely calculated in the gravitational uh, technology so that it will not fall down at all. That is why if you observe the temple structure outside, you will always see that the elevation, the contour of the elevation will have a kind of tapered uh, line which from begins from the lowest molding of the Adishtana up to the pinnacle of the Prasada. So therefore, to give more strength, they actually built two rows of walls. One wall was the outer wall of the Garbhagriha, whereas the other wall would be, you know, the, the supportive wall which again uh, protects the Garbhagriha and above that when both these uh, walls were paved above and given uh, a superstructure is built above it, the, the, the below part of it served as a production of Pata. That is why wherever we find a Sandhara temple, we find a lot of perforated windows or Chala Vatayanas provided in the wall. About this, I will explain when we explain the Vitti, what are the uh, decorations done on Vitti, what are the other adjuncts which are placed on the Vitti. Now, this is an humble temple and now coming to an elaborate structure. So, in an elaborate structure, the plan will have a Garbhagriha, an Antarala, an Arjamantapa, then you have a Gudamantapa, then we have Mahamantapa, then we have the uh, Mukhamantapa or Mukhachatushki, then we have three small Mukhamantapas to the Mahamantapa. This is the Mahamantapa. After the Mahamantapa, we have the Vahana Mantapa, where the vehicle of the uh, God, the presiding deity is stationed. Then we have 
the Balipita and the Vajastamba in order. These things will be explained while I am discussing about the temple objects. Now, as days passed by, lot of rituals started being, were being performed in connection with the major temple deity. And the Parivaralayas which I was talking also were included. Even they were built afresh or they were included to the explain, uh, ex uh, existing structures. This is the Devi shrine or the Amman shrine as it is called. So this becomes the primary Parivaralaya. But this Parivaralaya also is a later inclusion which starts from the late Chola period and uh, which again uh, gets more popular during the Vijayanagara period. And then we have various other Parivaralayas. Then there were Mantapas built for various purposes like the Kalyana Mantapa or the Vasantotsa Mantapa, Dolotsa Mantapa and all those things which will be discussed during our uh, temple architecture Mantapa part. And this is a Ranga Mantapa where uh, various cultural uh, activities were performed. Then this is what is called as the Prakara. Prakara is the outer wall of the temple and we have a Mahadvara. And some, many a times the, there will be a kind of uh, uh, a hypostyle uh, uh, porch built surrounding the temple. So these are colloquially called as Prakara Mantapa, but the, the technical term to be used is the Malika. Even outside the temple, there may be some mantapas like the Utsa Mantapa, Pushkarini, and there are various other things like uh, uh, water sources like the well, Vapi, and all those things. So, all these things constitute or comprise a complete temple plan. There are some towns like Srirangam and Madurai, where the entire city or the township itself becomes a temple complex. So, therefore, there are various other... Uh, Utsav mantapas or some minor mantapas which are which are, which are uh, built into the enclosures of the temple, which we'll discuss in the further. So this is about the uh, simple and the complex plans of the temple. Now, here this is one thing where we have done. We were talking about how if the temples were constructed on a ground, selecting of ground. But we saw that there were many temples which were constructed on rock beds and hillocks. Now, how, were they, how did they do there? Now, on a rock bed or a hillock, you cannot dig a foundation or you cannot, all these things are not possible. So, we understand that the rock, the boulder itself was uh, uh, leveled to some uh, extent and the Vinyasa Sutra of the temple. Vinyasa Sutra is that now, there are two sutras used while constructing or laying the plan of the temple. One is the Manasutra. See, Manasutra usually will be to the center axis of the temple and it will go through. It will have, it will be running through the, uh, from the Mahadvara, through the Balipita, the Dhaja Mantapa, Vahana Mantapa, the, the Guda Mantapa, until the Karbhanyasa, where the Residing deity is installed further also. So the central line axis which is drawn is the Manasutra. But the contour of the temple which is drawn is called as the Vinyasa Sutra. Now here we can see how the Vinyasa Sutra is, is actually chiseled on the rock bed and we can see that the depression is given and Rock, the stone, uh, paved dressed stones are placed, uh, pushed into that contour for strengthening it. This is the Vinyasa Sutra of a temple. Now, the other uh, uh, two kinds of temples we find in the Indian subcontinent are the rock cut sanctuaries as well as the structural temples. Now, Indians had excelled in the rocket sanctuary, building rocket sanctuaries as early, you know, even in the uh, pre-Christian era. And the, the many people have a doubt if this is mentioned in the Vastu Krantha. There are some Vastu Kranthas like Vishwakarma Vastu Shastra and others, which do mention about Guha Vastu or Guhalayas, where huge boulders are uh, selected and done. See, this is, this has to be considered, is because it is one of the wonders of the world, which 
uh, we have uh, we have failed to recognize this is the kailasa temple from elora and we have to see that the entire temple complex the, the elevation the, the prakara and everything from here to here this entire temple has been chiseled out of one one single boulder it is not a structural or masonry work at all so all these the entire structure it has been chiseled out of one single stone a monolithic temple and it is not a masonry structure even in the masonry structure we have some uh, our indian sculptors have created some laurels by installing the te- by constructing temples of bhudeshwara and tanjavur ganga and cholapura again as i was mentioning these are all these are all this shows the technical skills which the sthapatis had achieved in india even two millenniums ago it is not something newly improved uh, uh, on the contrary with a lot of modern technology and modern uh, you know implements today i really doubt if anybody can build uh, a, a strong temple as it has been done in our ancient past so this is a very broad introduction into the construction methodology of a temple and in future lectures wherever it is necessary i will be touching upon the points of which relate to the construction methodology also Thank you.